forward in these unprecedented times. And I, I think whatever we can do to ensure that all staff are aware of that collaborative relationship and problem solving, I think would be really helpful. Um, I don't know what that would look like, a joint statement or, or something. And you, you're, you may already be doing that, but I just, um, you know, I know there's been so much work behind the scenes to make sure everybody's on the same page. And I just, I, it would be great if everybody could hear that or as many people as possible could hear that and not assume changes were made without that collaborative process. Yeah, we had about 150 people at our staff town hall um, that was sort of co-facilitated by Brent and Elizabeth who are the union co-presidents. And Elizabeth made some remarks about the working relationship um, at the start of that. So I think at least that group of folks got to actually hear from their leadership about the working relationship that we've had. So I think it's out there in that regard and we'll continue to, to put that out there in various ways. Anyone else? I guess I would just add that sort of procedurally by authorizing Don, knowing that these documents aren't fully fleshed out yet. You know, we didn't, we didn't really want to wait until next month for the board to have the full documents in front of them to act on, nor did we think it was necessary to call a special meeting of the board to, to take action on these. So that's the reason for authorizing Don, even though you don't have all of the details yet. It, it's mostly procedural um, that we need to codify the flexibility in the contract that we know we need to make this all work and that the union's willing to, to be flexible, which is great. I don't know that that's true everywhere, but I really, uh, I value the relationship we're building with our local union. I value their willingness to do what needs to be done to meet the needs of our kids and families. So uh, it's been great. Okay, so we need a motion, if nobody has any other comments, to authorize the board chair to sign a side letter. So moved. Okay, that's Krista. Is there a second? A second. Caleb. Caleb, all right. All those in favor of authorizing the board chair to sign a side letter, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Next is a community engagement committee update. And uh, this afternoon, I think I shared with everybody an update for tonight. Did everybody get that? Are you talking about the the community engagement plan? It was the right. notes Rob took from the oh. retreat. Yep. Did you get those? I don't know, Krista and Rob, you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, so since I wasn't at the retreat, I asked Rob if he would mind providing an update and I'll chime if, in if necessary, but, and thanks to Rob for doing a great job presenting what our plans are for the fall and really kind of listening to the feedback and capturing that. So I'll let you go for it, Rob. All right, thanks, Krista. Um, yeah, if you haven't had a chance to look at what Don sent out, it basically sort of took that the timeline that we had looked at um, at the retreat or that was in the retreat packet, added some of the conversation pieces that we had uh, regarding community engagement this fall. And, uh, and then on that timeline also sort of um, highlighted uh, some questions we, we still sort of maybe want to tackle as a committee, but then down the, down the pike as a board. And, uh, and Kristen offered that the last year's sort of budget timeline in regards to um, talking and presenting to the community. So I, I threw that on there also. 
Um, and uh, so we have a meeting next Tuesday, uh, September 1st. And there we're um, looking at a, a, a lot of things, um, thinking about engaging and, and surveying folks on how they're doing with school restart. So obviously that won't start right away in September, but in early October, thinking about just getting feedback from families, students, faculty, staff, um, just how they're doing, get a sense uh, what's working and what's not. And then uh, the big, um, bigger ticket item is working with the committee and community members um, with, with sort of regarding, uh, you know, sort of la not launching, but really formally making public the NESDAQ report and what that might look like in regards to not just sort of throw it out there and and have with no context and sort of set off um, fire alarms and, and start fires all over the place. So thinking of ways we can really sort of lay out um, what, what the report says, some of the highlights, and then what are the considerations uh, moving forward from that. So that will be on to be discussed uh, next Tuesday. Um, with input from community members, like what, what makes the most sense? What is what is the best way? And also consider timing with that. Um, you know, at the re retreat, we had talked about utilizing the November election and, and, and the board sort of timeline with facilities planning, we had talked about sort of make, making a decision at the end of November. Um, I did reach out to a couple couple town clerks and, and get their feedback regarding the election. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but the state of Vermont is hired out a third party firm and they're going to be mailing out all ballots to all registered voters throughout the state. So that third party firms in New Hampshire. So there, there'd be no way we could put like a straw poll actually in mailing ballots, mail in ballots. Obviously folks can still go to the polls on November 3rd, the 4th. Um, so we haven't lost that opportunity necessarily. Um, but it's not uh, not an option anymore necessarily to include it with the ballot. So, um, so you know, another we had talked about direct mailings and maybe you know we continue down that line uh, with the same timeline, but to sort of you know decouple that idea from actually mail-in ballots. Um, but you know, I talked to Sally Ober here in Lincoln, and you know, she had, she thought numbers-wise that the majority of people won't be voting in person, but she would be open to having a, a straw poll of some sort at, at the Lincoln polling station. I can't speak for the other four towns. Um, so uh, that, that just wanted to pass that along. I didn't know if folks knew, knew about that or not. Um, and uh, what else did I have? I have to look at my notes here. Um, and then I think that, you know, the, the big ticket item again is, is once we sort of get the NESDEC report out there, um, think about uh, uh, late October, mid October, sort of um, webinar, town town hall meeting, uh, to sort of not only revisit the values we collected from last year's community engagement, but then also to sort of to, to inform, educate, uh, and be transparent as possible what that report sort of means going down the pike. I think it'd be a great opportunity too to really engage the community and and see if there are any other you know, ways that maybe we have some blind spots um, in regards to can we involve them in creative uh, problem solving. And, uh, and then and then continue to maybe at the end of October, early November, do some sort of electronic survey uh, also, and maybe with the direct mailing. Um, so I guess that's the update I have at, at the moment. I, I did speak with um, this sort of I know Ian Elberson and, and chatted with him about, you know, would they be interested in helping create some sort of um, educational video about here's where we are, uh, here, here are the options. And he said he'd be on board with that. So uh, another project we might have is he said we, we want to create a script and then, just, you know, give him like visuals or numbers that then he could create a visual for regarding if it's what a tax rate could look like or you know, look at um, finances moving down the pike if we status quo stays and stuff like that. So he's on board. He, he seems like he'd, he'd really enjoy that project. And I think it'd be another great way to help educate um, our our owners uh, as far as what, what's going on. Krista, anything else to add? 
Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to think about what any, are there any missing pieces that this group needs to talk through before we go to the community engagement group and some of the undecided that you alluded to one is around the timing of the NESDEC study you know it's it's out there in the community and, and this is also a question for you Kevin I guess and you know it's out there but I don't think a whole lot of folks have dialed into it because there are so many other pressing things and you know as Rob said we want to be really mindful of the priority most at least family members have on what the back to school situation is going to look like um, so you know any feedback this group has on you know, when, you know, if you look at the timeline, we talk about um, doing in early October, October, some sort of, a, you know, how's it been going being back to school survey. Um, but is that, does that proceed sharing the NASDAQ study? Um, you know, what are people thinking on that? Um, and then also in the timeline a little bit, um, Above that is the questions about, you know, what are the opportunities for the community to be connected with decision making and creative problem solving. So really trying to decide what, you know, are we asking of the community and what can they actually affect, affect through their input. Um, so those are, those are two things I think about that would be helpful to hear a little bit more about from this group before we go to um, the community engagement committee. Um, and maybe some of this was discussed at the retreat and I apologize for not being there for that. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'm thinking of is, and, and Rob really captured that, is that when we do start putting information out there, um, what's our capacity to provide lots of detail on whatever we can around numbers and costs of various options and, um, you know, giving people as much info as they can have that we can provide so folks can really understand all the different components of the situation we're in and the possible options we can consider. Sarah LaPerle? I'm, this actually doesn't have as much to do with the NESDAQ study as the purpose behind the check-in on school. Or if, I mean, is that something that we are really looking for? Or is that, I mean, I'm just curious on the reasoning behind that part. Yeah, so um, is it okay if I jump in, Don? Um, so I, so I've been participating in the communications team around back to school planning and um, and I think, you know, considering what's most first and foremost on families' minds and a way to keep people engaged, that seems like a really good question to ask, but perhaps coupled in some way with future bigger picture questions. And, um, you know, Sue McCormick is often encouraging us to find ways to get input from folks on what's going on that's most relevant to them in the moment, and then asking them for, for input on specific things. And so I don't know if those, that back to school question totally resides in the communication around just back to school, or if it would be coupled with uh, this work. Um, but it's a touch point and any touch point I think is a good one that we can offer. Um, and a lot of that work is kind of overlapping. You know, people are tuned in in a big way right now. They're wanting, what they're wanting is not necessarily what we're thinking about, but it's, it's a captive audience that's, that we want to engage with, but not be like tone deaf to what's, first and foremost in their mind. Yeah, to, to second, Krista, sorry, Steve, I jumped in, I'll, I'll So I guess um, maybe Sarah's point might be um, whether or not that's duplicating anything 
Patrick's group is doing at this point, the kind of feedback loop they've developed? Yeah, it would be so because I'm sitting on both of those committees where we're really being pretty deliberative about our timing and working together. So, you know, we kind of have a shared timeline. So there won't be, I think the benefit is that there's, we're trying hard to not have duplication. We're trying to maximize maximize the audience on all fronts. <laughs> um, it's getting trickier. I'll just say that as, as our school folks are getting really immersed in what back to school is going to look like, um, the need for communication does not go away, but the capacity for those folks to think about how to communicate is, is waning. And so Adora Frazier at Starksboro has been amazing in chairing this committee. And we're just trying to like keep her a little bit longer to not lose this momentum that I think we, that that group's been done a really good job of, um, of building with back to school information. But it's a really nice segue, like here's back to school. And so, so we're working really closely together. Dave? With, re, with regard to surveys that uh, may be going out, um, it's important to me that we be able to disaggregate the information uh, to the greatest extent possible. It was concerning to me uh, when we did a survey about um, uh, how uh, distance learning worked for our children uh, that we were not able to disaggregate that data for um, free and reduced place lunch students versus uh, other students um, or students with access to internet versus students that don't have access to internet or students of color versus uh, uh, white uh, students. So um, to the extent that we can disaggregate uh, the information we get back in these surveys, I think can be very Im important and informative on how we move forward with regard to equity in particular. Krista? Yeah, that's a great point, Dave, and something that Sue, and when we did the community engagement work in the fall, talked a lot about was trying to capture demographics um, and I think with the school surveys, we didn't necessarily do that. And that was, um, you know, just, just maybe a missed opportunity and a desire to just get, get really tangible information as quickly as we could. But, um, but she has encouraged us to think about that. A any surveying that there's ways to capture some, some demographic information more sensitively. Um, and that, she, you know, she was really encouraging us regardless of whether it's a school survey or a budget survey or whatever it is to find ways to ask some questions so we know who we're hearing from and who, um, yeah, who, whose input we're getting. Um, she also talked about the, the importance of sharing back out some, the, what we heard. Um, so there was a survey asked about how students are feeling about going back to school. And so I, we've been talking in our committee about how could we quickly and easily share a snapshot of how students are feeling. Because they took the time to fill out the survey, it would be great to let people know. Rob? Yeah, uh, to sort of go back to Sarah's point and, and Steve and, um, in, in thinking about, you know, is, is it connected to the community engagement work or for the board, I, I guess, to, to have a sense of how people are doing. Um, you know, I think moving from that, uh, it's important, you know, for us to consider what capacity people have to take in sort of all the data that's being thrown at them and understand the implication. So if, if people are, are, are drowning, I don't think maybe, you know, a week, maybe we give it a little more time before we sort of um, have to drop some, some, you know, heavier, heavier stuff uh, onto them and, uh, and decisions to make. Um, I, you know, I, I was reading the Addison Independent and there's a petition going around in, in the Addison Central School District right now regarding their facilities uh, timeline um, to stop that process. And um, so I, I wouldn't want to see us in, in that situation also as a board um, where we're not proactive and really trying to gauge how our families and community is doing first and 
and use that as information as we move forward trying to uh, inform, educate, and, and work with our community members. So that, that's my thinking at the moment too. Anyone else? Okay. Just a uh, um, nitpicking point, but um, in these in these notes, which I finally had a chance, I finally found and started reading. Uh, there's, there's, there's a bunch of, uh, and I do this all the time. There's a bunch of is's that I think are ins or ifs. So I was sort of struggling with that for a little bit. Um, and I'm assuming on the last page. The working list of questions and scenarios um, is do we want to have a rank choice in regards to the three options and these are the three options are uh, are actually priorities we want to prioritize uh, exceeding the spending threshold or prioritize programs or prioritize schools I'm reading that correctly Yeah, sorry, but I, I, we, my family and I just got back from vacation, so I was sort of throwing that together at the 11th hour. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I just, I was sort of putting ideas out there, like, you know, if we do do surveys or whatever, um, and thinking about ranked choice voting, uh, you know, I thought that might be an interesting, in, interesting approach just to see how things might shuffle out. Um, and this was, kind of, this was kind of the throw throw everything, all the options at them that we talked about at the retreat. Are we missing something on the last page? Was there, that's the only question. Was there any of those, were there any options that we'd said we were gonna throw out there at them that aren't reflected here? And is everybody able to see that last page? That's hearing anybody say they can't. You mean page three? Are yeah. you talking about the community engagement timeline or the scenarios? Yeah, the working list of questions and scenarios. Oh. That this is sort of grouped together, uh, I think, in a rational way. Uh, it's presented a, a little bit different than the options I think we were, we've been sort of traditionally talking about, um, I think the options that we were talking about were more, um, you know, which, which combinations of schools might still remain or be grouped with other schools or whatever. And this, these options are more um, kind of a, a funding, categorized by sort of funding mechanisms. And so, Steve, you're talking about uh, the retreat when we said that we would try to get a read from the community of A, do they, are they, what is their, um, what is their feeling on whether or not they would vote to close their town school? What is their feeling about giving the board the power to close their school? Right. What are their thoughts about whether the board chooses to repurpose their school and what is their thoughts surrounding paying much higher taxes and exceeding the threshold. Right. Or, um, or frankly, keeping things the same, which I think is where we start to talk about the reduction in programs. Like in order to stay under the threshold, but, and not close schools, that starts to affect programs and there may be other combinations here that also affect programs, but um, so I was just thinking if, if, if page three kind of represents our current thinking on how we're going to formulate a, a survey, uh, is this, is this the format we want or is there, was there, do we want to backtrack a little bit to the, and be more direct from the discussion at the retreat or does this cover it? And I've just glanced at it quickly, so it's not like I have the answer to what I'm talking about. 
Krista? I, I mean, I think it for me relates to an even bigger question, which is, are we asking people to weigh in on viable options? And that's a concern I have as well. Um, but in the moment, I'm not sure we're at the point of being ready to formulate exactly what that survey is going to look like. I think we need to talk a little bit more about it. This group definitely needs to talk more about what that survey would entail. And it would come after, I think if my timing's right, it would come after some, some engagement and information sharing. Um, so I don't know, I don't, unless I've, I've got it wrong, I think we're going to be building up to what a survey would be after quite a bit of inform, you know, really um, significant information sharing and, and engaging with folks. Um, but it does make me think about a lingering concern, which is, uh, are we going to ask folks to vote for something that we know we can't actually do? And we can't and we can't actually do well i mean i just wonder if we already know that certain things are just not feasible kevin i i'm not i'm not just i'm not sure what there is that's not feasible with these three questions it's um a matter of choice um and so if you step back and look at what sort of response we can get with these things. Maybe people don't care how much money they spend and you just keep going the way you are. Or, you know, maybe programs are important to people within some cost constraint or on and on and on. So once you get those building blocks, then all of a sudden you can go back with a whole lot more clarity of how your programming or your your facilities or your budget um, can can come together to make something happen that will result in the next step being, okay, b based on whatever constraints and you'll end up with constraints and maybe that's what's not feasible, but you'll end up with constraints and given these constraints, here's what we can do. And maybe there's A, B options or A, B, C options or just an A option, but um, there's, there's nothing wrong with asking people if they want to spend this as the sky's the limit or or, or whatever you know um so i guess i'll just leave it at that yeah my worry is i mean uh, it's i think this is a good conversation where i think we're we're having a good conversation right now um the uh the week of october 22nd on the page before this looks to be the sort of the target date for maybe sending this out? Is that still, that's still, I mean, um, in terms of the amount of time we have and the number of discussions we can have, that's not a lot of time. Um, I also think if we were able to put together some of the answers to some of these bullets that Rob has on here uh, in a round way and then Patrick, you probably would have some insight on best ways to format some of this, but um, it's kind of like a values recheck from what I can see. Um, it, without, without necessarily proposing hard and fast options and scenarios, giving people sort of these three implications with some data behind it seems like a good, uh, a good values check that we could use to then maybe work in a particular scenario direction. Dave? So it, it's, it's been a while since I looked at the NASDAQ uh, report. It, it, if my recollection is, is accurate, they did a pretty reasonable job of laying out pros and cons of each of the uh, 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 alternatives that they were asked to study. Uh, my concern is that uh, a lot of the public is going to look at that and say, whoa, the school board didn't even consider um, the possibility of maintaining the structure the same way it is now. Um, 
I, I, I think I think we have heard from the administration and that that they have uh, considered that, but I, I'm not sure that um, citizens opening that document are going to have a reaction that's that. Uh, I think many will have the reaction. I fear many will have the reaction that says uh, the school board just didn't even consider keeping schools the way they are. Okay, there were other hands and I, I'm not, I thought there was another hand. Sarah McLean? Oh, and then Patrick. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you, Dave. And I also, um, I, I also haven't reviewed uh, the report since the retreat. Uh, actually, that's not true. I did just because I saw an error, um, which I confirmed with my town clerk, but I'll email about that later. But um, I haven't looked at it, you know, very thoroughly. But, you know, even being on the board, I walked away from looking at it a few times for the retreat and not feeling content with an understanding that the scenarios that we are being presented were going to offer lasting solutions. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how we, how, we, how we present the report and then also you, you just have to really put it in context. Patrick? Um, one of the, one part of the discussion from the retreat that I recall the board having that I didn't see land in those notes was um, inquiring with the community about delegating the authority to close a school to the board um, and just seeing what the temperature was for that action. Um, and as I think about, you know, as we've been talking about the, the sort of values conversation that we're just talking about in terms of those questions and I feel like going that route again before we go back to the specific scenarios about how many schools and, and all of that makes sense because which scenario in terms of schools we choose to operate or, or not is going to have a significant impact on either our spending or our programs or the number of buildings that we we operate. And so if we're not clear about how the options are prioritized in terms of programs or spending or schools open, then we may go down a path in in exploring scenarios that rub pretty strongly against what the will of our community is. So it does feel like we've, we've, we, I think we've laid the foundation for understanding at a pretty concrete level what the, the interest of our community is. But I think we need to bring that home to be really clear about what that is and then say, great, your preference is to spend more money. Here are scenarios that keep it as much as the same as possible that spend more money. So we can present the community with scenarios that match what the desire is versus not knowing that desire. Maybe the strongest desire is to not spend more money and we present something that spends a lot more money and that that probably disengages people pretty quickly or perhaps engages them really intensely in ways we didn't intend to engage them in. Um, so I, I like that approach of let's let's check the temperature and then try to match scenarios that fit the temperature. Krista? And I think um, if there's a way to reflect on the values that were established in the fall as part of the temperature checking, I think that would be really helpful because we spent a lot of time developing those and I think that's a good place to start with folks. I thought we talked something about prioritizing those values, it's sort of a giving them an order so we knew when we were applying them to our, to what we were going to look at that we would we would know which one is the most important because for in the beginning of it we didn't rank them we just listed them and then we talked a lot about what do, we kept repeating the word appetite what's the appetite what's the appetite and I think 
knowing the values would help us get clarity on the appetite as well. And I'm not sure those, the values that we've done the work on, I agree we need to connect them. I'm not, I'm struggling with what that connection necessarily looks like because I think the values we put together in the fall with the community don't necessarily correspond directly to the four or five questions that we've talked about checking the temperature on. So I think there's some work to figure out how to marry the two, but I think it's important to try and do that. Steve? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the people that showed up at these events last year, um, they're obviously the engaged, the most engaged of our community. and that says something that, that bears some weight. Um, but it's not uh, a full ownership kind of temperature check that I think this mail out survey or the, and the electronic versions are going to be. And I think this stepping back and using this organizational, you know, these organizational priorities, I mean, these are, even though people may have other types of priorities that they have listed in our, in our past engagement, these three topics here really kind of, I think, boil down what maneuvering room the board has to go in any particular direction. Um, so getting maybe a blend of the two uh, in, a, in, a, in a survey that steps ahead of the NASDAQ survey. I think the NASDAQ survey is a great tool but putting it out ahead of this, I think is really, that's, that's really a, a tough thing to do. I think it gives us some perspective on how, what, what the different options of closing schools kind of actually accomplish for us, but it's not something we necessarily want to um, throw out in front of people and say, here, what do you think of these things? You know, without having more understanding of the, um, of the background values. I just want to take a minute, check in. Andrew, we haven't heard from you or Liz. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, so I was just still thinking about how it would be great if we had some sort of video. Maybe you haven't seen these, but if some of you have seen the uh, Khan Academy videos where the guy talks about something and then you can see him writing and thinking about some sort of um, video that shows that triangle like we've got this problem to solve and there's no pot of gold and so well there is a pot of gold that's the taxpayer's money and that's one option for you but here's this triangle here's revenue here's uh, facilities and here's staff and let's look at each corner of that triangle and what the possible scenarios are and at the end some sort of link um, for the folks who are watching video or a QR code for folks who are getting it, you know, we publish something on paper, but to help them really see how we're conceptualizing the problem and then they can weigh in with what they think do you want to, we don't care about the spending threshold, we'll spend as much money as possible, like Patrick saying, okay, great, well that helps us, we'll, we'll explore that. Or if it's the other corner where um, we don't find that's, uh, we don't want the schools if we have to lose our staff. Uh, so let's explore either all the towns vote and then all the towns said they were going to vote. And then it turns out no one wants to close their school and that turns into a mess. Or you give it to the board and we decide. Or you don't want to close the schools and so now we have to cut staff and how do you want to go about that. But some sort of way to conceptualize the problem and then allow people to weigh in on that afterwards. Liz, did you have anything to add? I, I agree with Andrew's idea. I think, I think that's, it was really important for me to think of it that way. So I imagine it could be helpful for our community as well. And then Krista, did you have your hand up as well? Did you just call on me? I think you yeah. said Krista. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know, oh, okay. <laughs> but I, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot swirling in my head about how to move this forward. Um, so if anybody else wants to chime in, go ahead. I think everybody's swirling. 
Well, it, this I came up with this idea because somewhere along the line I come up across that thing. I think, I think it was related to food that that people want to eat uh, uh, fast, good quality, and cheap, right? And they say you can have any three as long as you pick two, right? You can have fast and cheap, or fast and good but not cheap. But but basically that's the bind we're in. You can have any three. You can have uh, affordable taxes. You can have all the school buildings you want. And you can have all the staffing you want. You can have all three as long as you pick two. Krista. Yeah, so I think that's the way we tell that narrative, whether it's in it, I love the video idea and there's lots of other pieces. I think that's gonna be really important. It's gonna be really important that we get the perspective of as many people as possible. And, you know, just thinking about the vocal minority that's really active and has the opportunity and time to invest in sharing their voice um, may have a really different perspective than the other folks who might not be as able to share their voice. And so I'm really aware of that as maybe more than I've ever been just like this moment in time. Um, little plug for a podcast that I've been watching that is kind of speaks to this is nice white parents and in Vermont, it might be nice middle and upper middle class parents. Um, so I think really making sure we have a very diverse group of voices is gonna also be huge. And I'm worried that the Community Engagement Committee is the small group of folks that are gonna have to kind of weed through a lot of this. Um, and it is a huge lift and we, this full group um, only meets once a month. And so I, I don't really know how to grapple with that. I don't know if um, we need to be spending more time with this larger group on this. Um, I think there are good, it's a great sounding board of board members and that vocal minority. Um, so uh, I think our next step is to figure out what to start sharing out with the community about these long-term challenges while not being tone deaf to the COVID reality. That's the first challenge. That's the most immediate thing. Steve. Yeah, just a suggestion. I mean, um, earlier it said the questions for Patrick and the admin team, where are there opportunities for the community to connect with decision making? Well, I'm curious if um, it might be an opportunity um, for the folks that were on that, you know, the spreadsheet that went around for actions. Um, you know, one, one way that people get reaction to surveys that are mailed out or electronic where they don't reach um, you know, the disadvantaged or the economically challenged or whatever is that, that you do a house to house. Um, you go door to door. Uh, are there folks out there willing to uh, volunteer for that kind of an effort um, as part of the, you know, part of their ability to connect with decision making? Um, that's just a thought. We're not like, you know, the downtown of Chicago, you know, or the suburbs where people can door to door means there's a lot of uh, density and you can really get a lot of traction with that. We're, we're spread out all over the place. It's a little bit more difficult to do, but um, there may be some willingness for folks to take that on. Dave. Oh. I've been door to door in four of our five towns. It, in a campaign season, I was never able to hit all the doors in all four towns. Um, that's a massive, massive task. Um, yeah. And I, I learned a heck of a lot. It's absolutely uh, very educational to go talk to citizens door to door without question, but it's a huge task. And I don't think we have the time or the energy to do that. Krista? I think the webinar has been kind of an equalizer, or Zoom has been a little bit more of an equalizer, or maybe not an equalizer, but many more people are participating. 
than in other ways. So I think that could help. Like if you can zoom from your couch with your kids there in the next room, that provides a whole nother level of access. So I think that is something we should definitely be doing. Well, my head is swirling just trying to think at the the starting where the starting point is and let alone what you're trying to get to so i'm glad we're talking about it i'm i'm not sure that we have an idea about how we're going to get there you know Rob. yeah i just have a quick question um in in the full nasdaq report and again i haven't looked at it in a long time too like the 80 page plus one does it include like the, the school scenario synopsis? I guess I'm not sure what you're asking. But so at, at, the, re, um, at the retreat, we were given like a, a short little document that said like scenario one, scenario two, scenario seven, option CB two, whatever. Um, is that actually in the full NASDAQ report? Because if it's not coupled with that, do we have to put the school reconfiguration options out there with the report? Because when you look at the report, that's more of a demographic numbers. And so I'm just curious, I haven't looked at the full report in a long time. Question. So they, so technically both the, so I think first question was, are they the same or separate? So we have the, the, the NESDEC report has the, the demographics and the capacity study. And separate from that, like a separate attachment in the email and everything is the, um, the options document. So I do think they are separate, probably intentionally, and they are currently both public documents. So they're not, they're not sort of hidden from anyone. Anyone can access them. Having said that, the board can choose when and how and which pieces to make more widely known by the community to fit with its communication strategy going forward. That's, that's my take on it. And I think that answers your question, Rob, but let me know if I missed something there. No, it, it answers it. And I, I just run something through my head, like when you, when you put that report with those, with the options um, and you don't get out in front with the other options that we're considering, um, I think that's when uh, we put ourselves in quite a pickle. But at the same time, since that's public, I also don't want to make it look like we're trying to sweep those options under the rug for the time being, trying to buy ourselves some time, per se, and, and put a hide, you know, hide a reality possibly um, from from the public. I, it doesn't seem like a win-win situation, unfortunately. Kevin. So as, as far as the report, and this was discussed earlier about when to roll the report, the NASDAQ report out. And I, I'm not convinced that there's any news in the NASDAQ report. Um, there's some validation um, with the fact that with the depth and quality of their demographics and um, student population numbers that there's some validity there, but it's not news. And the options that they did um, were pretty much a regurgitation of what the charge to the facilities committee was originally. There's some nuances there, but there's, you know, again, there's nothing radical there. So I'm not convinced you're gonna like shine a light through that report to um, the constituency. And um, going back to some of the drivers that will, so so the, the other thing, you know, I was intending to talk to over the, the next item, but um, the report has not narrowed anything down. Matter of fact, our last facilities meeting, we sort of um, were getting divergent at one point. So until you have, a, have something that can 
consolidate the options and you know right now we're talking about these three things really what do you want to spend your money on or what do you want to result for you know the level of, of uh, funding you're gonna you want to provide until you can get something to drive reduction in those options we're just going to spin our wheels with it coming out in a report or coming out as the result of a retreat or what have you Patrick. Yeah, and, and I guess the, the part that we probably all realize, but I, I feel obligated to remind us all about is come January, if this board hasn't taken action to put something before the voters, that action, that, that inaction is action, right? So, um, not making a decision about change means change is going to happen to us in terms of programmatic impact and so that's the that becomes the default decision unfortunately as we wrestle with this really messy complicated work that has to be really handled with with delicate gloves um, and we need to get to some decision points in the pretty near future and, and that's part of what i think we're wrestling with and i don't know i don't know how necessarily to get there but i recognize the importance of getting there to some clarity about what are we going to ask the community to do pretty soon krista yeah and that's the the information that we share i think has to make that very clear what is if we do nothing this is what is going to happen and if we do something but it's only halfway there this is what's going to happen um and i think that's the from our timeline i think that's the work of october um you know mid to late october is just sharing that story as much as possible and getting the community really educated about that. I don't think we have that sounds like we don't have the time really to delay that any further. So it sounds like to me, September, mid September is, yeah, let's see how people are doing about school, but we have to start this. I think we're we're creeping up on the point where we have to ask some really pointed, tough questions of the community to get a sense of what what they're thinking is so we know how to move it forward with that information. Sarah McLean. In asking those tough questions, do we have um, clear ideas of how the programming uh, would be affected or staffing would be affected. I know that we have like the, you know, the presentation is that you'd need this many staff would have to go this many support staff. But as far as programming, do we have any tangible or articulated um, programming that would be lost uh, within action? Yeah, I mean, so I already have some folks on, you know, if they had X number of positions they had to reduce in their building, what would that look like? That work is happening. It becomes really, really complicated to make that impact known publicly because it immediately identifies specific people who would be in jeopardy of losing their job. Right? So if, if we say if, if, if there isn't any action taken, then we don't offer, and I always use chemistry as an example, just because I know Sarah loves it. If we don't make these decisions, then that means we lose chemistry at Mount Abe. There's a chemistry teacher at Mount Abe. We just personally identified the person who would lose their job. So that's where it gets really tricky when we're just bouncing ideas around and throwing something like that out there. Um, it has a significant ripple effect. And, and the reality is, you know, if it's 
chemistry this year, it would be something else the next year and something like we would continually be chipping away at our programming the longer we wait to take action that prevents that from happening. Liz? I also, um, sometimes it can be another way to look at something instead of the deficit of we lose all of these programming is also, uh, Caleb had said something at, uh, about looking forward. So uh, we had a little discussion about if we closed a, or if a town closed a school, um, how, how would that affect us long term and what would the benefits of that be? And so you can look at um, even thinking of the programs that we could have or the opportunities we could have and when people feel like maybe they're missing something in their school that they're not getting, if that's a, a parents, you know, I, I feel like also looking at it from this is what we could offer if we did do these things can kind of feel a little better than just feeling, um, noticing all, all of the deficits. Uh, so that can be another way, I think, to present the information. Andrew? Uh, to uh, Patrick's point and also to Chris's point, I think it's also important for us to help the community understand that uh, their inaction is still action too. Um, that basically if they go to the polls and say no on a, a budget that exceeds the spending threshold, we're probably not gonna put that out there unless they say that's okay. But regardless, the, the the taxpayer says no to the budget, and then all the towns say no to closing schools of any kind, then really the board is pushed into a corner and the only thing we have left to cut is programming. And I think to Sarah's point, we probably can't be super clear about exactly what programming gets cut or what that looks like, but the, the, the institution becomes, I would imagine at some point, non-viable. And I think figuring out how to, not sound draconian about it, but also to be really real with folks about it. you can't avoid this and it's going to require more than just showing up at the polls. You have to give us your input. Krista, I think you had your hand up and then I'll go to Sarah. Yeah, I was just thinking about, um, you know, originally I imagined we would share information and then have some opportunities for input. And I wonder if we might front load with some honest kind of conversations, then sharing information and then having some more honest conversations. I, I guess what I mean is that the transparency of the struggle is really valuable for people to hear. Um, uh, that the kind of call in and just hear us talk through some of this and share your thoughts on it. Helps people to feel like they're part of the problem solving before they get handed all of the, the details and the numbers. So it's just something to think about in terms of our timing. Sarah McLean. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you, Krista. I think the more transparency and communicating to the community we have, the better. And I, I would love to communicate from a perspective of opportunity as opposed to scarcity, but I myself am not hearing that. I'm, I'm hearing that in order for us to maintain, pardon me, where we are, we need to manage uh, our district differently. So I, I mean, I, I would love to say, you know, all of a sudden we're gonna have more programming or there's gonna be this and there's gonna be that, but. I'm not understanding it, that that is uh, a possibility here, given this, you know, the information that I'm seeing. So I don't know how we communicate that. Patrick? I can speak to that just briefly. So I, as I've been trying to, because part of my task is to work with our finance team here and to get the numbers behind all of these things, because uh, that's not something that NESDEC was going to be providing for us. That was something we knew we had to do internally. And so I'm playing with a bunch of different scenarios. Uh, it does look to me like we can, if we find these efficiencies, if we create these efficiencies, we can expand programming. For example, I think what is, what is feasible, 
it would need further study to confirm that it can happen is to, you know, if we consolidate schools considerably, we could have a full-time nurse for all of our students, which we don't currently have. We could have health for all of our elementary students, which we don't currently have, and possibly add world language for all of our students, which we don't offer to anybody right now. So those are, those are three sort of supports or programs that I think most people would find valuable that are quite possible um, if we create these efficiencies. And again, you know, we, and your, your point earlier, Sarah, I think, and this is what Kayla brought up at the retreat, not feeling like any of these options sustain us long-term. I'm not sure I agree. I do think for sure there are options in there that buy us a little bit of time and there are options in there that buy us a lot more time and maybe get us over the hump and can be sustainable. Obviously the, the more efficiencies we create, meaning the fewer schools we operate, the greater the likelihood that it sustains us for a while um, and the greater the likelihood that we can expand on programming and not just try to hold on to what we have. So that's, I, I do think it's possible um, to achieve that. And we can further study that and hopefully give some supporting details that make people feel more confident, but initial glance looks like that could happen. Trevor? Just a, just a little bit of a follow on ramble is we need to right size our facilities and then they become sustainable. And, and until they're right sized, meaning that they're, they're utilized and they're, um, the capacity is being used, um, you're going to be through this, you're going to continue this cat and mouse game of trying to cut to, to um, get a budget by. So, we we need to we need to think about right sizing things, and um, utilizing things to the most most efficient thing, as as most efficient as possible. And, and it, you know it, it really scares me that the, the whole the, the the to me the most important thing is the programming. And we go down. We're talking about this whole thing, and every time we circle around something, the programming is what's going to suffer. So, um, you know, if we, we need to really make that an important decision, make that at the forefront as well. Seeing anyone, oh, Steve? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm just saying, you know, after sort of listening to the conversation and, and uh, going back through these notes, I really don't see any real problem with the timeline. I think it, I think it's rational. Um, I think we should stick to it. I don't think we should put things off or, you know, try to and I have to agree with Kevin in terms of the content of the NESDEC study. I don't think there's anything really new. We brought a lot of these options up at these meetings we had with the community last year. Not, it's not like we're really springing anything on them through that report. Um, I think it's really just a matter of how it's, uh, how it's presented. The, you know, the background sort of, or the, the introduction to the presentation of that report that for folks to understand why it was done and what kind of a tool we're using it as, I think it's still something that can accompany uh, maybe even at the same time as this October 26th uh, priority survey that could go out or at least be pointed out as a resource for people to understand what some of these different scenarios look like under some of these different options, under some of these different priorities. So I think we could we could probably group this stuff together and, and get it out in October and um, and then, you know, stick to making a decision with whatever information that gleams. Kevin? So I guess 
we've had a lot of discussions, so there's a lot, a lot everybody has on their mind from everybody else. But I guess the the thing is, is I heard the communication committee saying they didn't have, they were concerned about capacity, and um, so I guess we need to. Do they? So do we end up formalizing some? Um, direction for them or do they go back and chew on what we've talked about tonight and come up with a, a strategy f based on the timeline that's already generated I'm, it seems like we're at the point that we should stop talking and do something I think it's this board's job to give direction to that group and if if this board is I thought that's sort of where we were heading at the retreat where we were talking about we need to know this information in order to progress further and so i i took a, my takeaway was that we were going to ask those tough questions so that we had more clarity to move to the next step and maybe i took away the wrong thing but i think that's i think we're at the the tough questions part Kevin? Which, which would be the page three questions? Uh, yes, that's that's what I took away from the retreat. Sarah LaFerre? Yeah, I mean, I keep going back. I like these three priorities and I like the, we had all these four options, but you know, I think about the town I live in where you might, it would maybe be interesting to know if the New Haven voters would actually prefer to close their school or have it repurposed like it you have to kind of have you might get a different you might get a different answer than what we expect from and and so I would love for the survey or whatever it is to try to get at the heart of I mean or get a little bit deeper so that we do go down a path that they are going that the voters of different towns are going to support. So I think the whole point of the survey is to go back to, um, and I know it's or to give the information is what we need to do in advance to give a proper survey that gives us information so we go down the right path in a short amount of time. Patrick. Just thinking a little bit about Kevin's comment earlier about his concern around programming and the impact of programming and even a statement that programming is the most important thing. And I, I wonder, and then I think about the role of, of the board and, and what each board member is tasked with. And I think about this as a board of trustees and thinking about my, my inner Val Gardner coming out here and, and the job of the board, which is not an easy task, is to be the informed agent for the owners. You have information that the owners as a large group don't have and in all reality because we've tried this in a lot of other ways for a lot of different topics, many many perhaps the majority of voters that are going to go to the polls aren't going to be going with all of the information. I don't think we've found a, a path that gets the majority of voters to the polls in a really informed way. So and this, this may be provocative and it's somewhat intended to be, is it the responsibility of this board to take a position and say, we as a board recognize that the program that we offer is the most important thing for us to focus, to focus on. Therefore, these other actions are actions that we want input from the community on that maintain the programming or perhaps expand the programming that we think is essential for our kids. Like, so does that, it puts the board in a position of taking a position on something that helps move us in a direction, which comes with risk, but might also be within the responsibility of the board. So again, I have my own thoughts on that, um, but I sort of put that out for the group to consider.
Yeah, it almost seems like if you're looking at the priorities list on page three that um, it's really option one or option three to maintain topic number two. I, mean, I, I can't really imagine there's anybody out there that's got a real stomach for losing program. Um, it's, it's the whole point of putting kids through school is to teach them something. So removing their options for education seems like a silly thing to be doing um, when you when you have other options. But there is another option. You can you can invest more in education even if it's not sort of rationally efficient, or you can um, make the facilities ends of things more compact and more efficient and then therefore retain program. So um, we could sort of knock, we, we could say number two is the thing that's being affected by one and three more than making two an option for folks to, um, to carve into. Krista? Um, I'll wait until others have gone because I've spoken a lot. Dave? So I'll wait. Okay. Dave? Um, thank you. So um, I think the board, I agree with uh, Patrick. I think the board has great responsibility. Um, we're privy to a lot of information. Um, we have uh, in-depth discussion among ourselves. We have uh, contact with people in the community. It's why we're on this board. Um, and, I, and I do believe we have responsibility. It's one of the things that really bugs me about policy governance. You know, this facilities discussion, this is all means, right? This is all means of having our kids be successful and programming, what kind of programming do they want to have? Um, and so, uh, yes, I think we have great responsibility. And yes, I think we ought to rethink how this board is going to address that responsibility, not just in terms of facilities, but in terms of our role uh, in the uh, public education of our community. Sarah McLean. I think it's an interesting point that Patrick raises and Dave. Um, my question is, so we gather all of this input from the community and we, we've asked for their values and we've, you know, measured them and wh who, what values were higher in people is how many people voted for them. And then for the board then to say, okay, thanks for that. But we, as a board, our priority is programming. I feel like that's that's that leaves out the community voice that we've been seeking for the past year. Krista. Yeah, that was my point. I I think we will have to as a board make a decision at some point, but I think to not go back to our community for their input is a misstep. And I think that um, even when you say programming, what that means is so varied depending on who you talk to. Um, for one parent, it might be 10 AP classes a semester. For another parent, it might be, does my kid have a safe place to be during the day? It's so varied and we will clearly never get everybody's input and never get information to everyone. Um, but I think we need to start the process with that goal in mind before we then move to a decision. And I think we've done a lot of work to get that input. Like, I don't think it's insurmountable. I think we did a really good job this fall. I think we have a lot of great methods and practices and goodwill that we've built up. So I think we can continue doing that and um, 
you know, I, I, I have hope that we'll, we'll be able to, um, I have hope that if we kind of model what we've done in the past, that that will be, that, that feels a lot better to me than just sort of making a, a decision without doing that. Dave. So can we reimagine schools for our community? Can we offer 10 AP courses? Maybe those are online. Maybe our advanced students are capable uh, of, of uh, uh, accessing and, and being successful in 10 AP courses that are online and overseen by um, uh, a, a number of teachers in the building, professional staff that guide them through this process. Um, but the bulk of their time and energy is spent online, whereas our responsibility as a public institution as public education, in my view, is a lot about um, making every child available or uh, uh, capable of being successful, active citizens in our community. And that says something to me about low income families and, and how they're successful or not. There's a reason why the largest high school in the state is in the prison system. Um, we we fail uh, we fail those kids. So, what's more important, um, uh, Spanish for all the kids, or making sure that all of our third graders are at the same level in math and reading? So, can we reimagine what education is in our community? Uh, a, a hybrid type of education. Um, COVID is forcing us to rethink education. Let's do it in a proactive manner. And then later on, figure out what facilities fit into that. Let's first figure out what we want education to look like for our kids. I just, I want to do a, a short process check. I just want to let everybody know it's 730. Our meeting is scheduled till eight o'clock. So we have possibly two more large discussions to have. So I just want to check in with everybody. We can keep going on this. We can try and close it up and move on. Or we're going to have to be here longer. I guess from my perspective for the community engagement committee meeting that's next Tuesday this is this is all really good and helpful information and I think that group will continue to chew on that and uh, you know members of this board that are on that group will add to that conversation and I don't think we're at the point of having to decide on what to ask the community at the end of October we're not there yet so um, so I feel pretty good about kind of our, our next steps but um, you know, the, anybody who's available to attend that isn't on the committee, please come and add your thoughts. Um, and there, there will probably just be some pulse taking that goes out around how things are feeling about, people are feeling about back to school and maybe some sharing of the NASDAQ report um, that happens between now and our next board meeting. Sarah McLean. Um, just before we leave this topic, I just wanted to ask Patrick, when you had introduced this idea of the board, you know, to have a position, you said that you have thoughts on, on this, that concept. And I wonder if you could share with us what your thoughts are, if we were to do that or what your recommendations would be. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure exactly. I mean, my thoughts on programming, I, I feel very, very um, firmly that the program that we offer our students is the most important thing. Um, so for me, if, if for my own kids, which are in our school system right now, if the choice was, 
and, and I'm thinking about when they were in elementary school because that may be where where the greatest impact could end up being. If the choice was, you know, have a struggling student have their needs met in a building that's in a different town than where I live, or have them attending the school in the town where I live and not have their needs met. I want their needs met. Um, so that it's absolutely crystal clear to me that strength in programming is more important than the building where that programming is taking place. I don't know if that's the, if that was the, what you were looking for from me. Um, but that's, that's where I stand. And I don't, I don't obviously downplay the impact of a statement has, right? Like that, to achieve that, we know that means some really hard decisions. But it's very clear to me that that's what's best for kids. Okay, I think I'm going to move us along. We're just going to sit on what we heard tonight and go from there. The next update is from the Facilities the Feasibility Study Subcommittee. And Kevin, you've added a few bits and pieces, but <coughs> yes. uh, at our <clears throat> we had a meeting um, first week in August. And uh, we had, we were privileged to have um, John Kennedy and um, Karen Ledoux from NASDAQ go through the report with us. Um, so there's a lot of discussion on, on that. Um, hopefully my lighting's okay. Um, you know, and, and we had sort of alluded to earlier, you know, the, the report, with some in-depth analysis pretty much confirms, you know, um, declining student en enrollments and, um, you know, underutilization of, of school buildings, you know, and, and I think Patrick said this before, but it, it was kind of discussed at the meeting in the last third or the, in a 30 year period, looking back 20 and looking forward 10, the MAUS district has nine, will have 900 less students in it than, than it did at the beginning of that 30, 30 year ban. Um, there was some rather lively discussion amongst the committee itself. Um, there was a little bit of discussion about with the report, did we get what we asked for? Um, and I think a lot of that centered around um, we, I, you know, it, it, I concurred that we got what we asked for with the report, but I think there was a lot of hope that we would have um, more information with the report, maybe even some conclusions, which, which we ended up uh, not having, and and really at the end of the day, it wasn't really um, planned that they would narrow down solutions for us. Um, talked a little bit about demographics regarding uh, COVID, um, you know, the whole concept of everybody leaving New York City and coming to Vermont, that sort of thing. They actually had a short, we had a short discussion with them. They actually have some experience in the Berkshires down in Massachusetts. And um, they're pretty early for them to make any conclusions, but they understood what the concern was or what, what the impact could be and are kind of watching that. Um, there was a discussion. If you looked at, if you look at their report, they're talking about, um, you know, you know, the capacity of housing, you know, the plans, houses, permits, and all that sort of stuff. So there was a little bantering back and forth about how can we continue to have declining enrollment when we're building houses, and um, you know, there's just some realities with that that we talked about. Um, we talked about, and then like a 
mentioned before, we didn't really have any clear conclusions, if you will. And, and matter of fact, um, at one point, the discussion within the group was becoming divergent and we kind of circle back to what the charge is and, you know, and Patrick chimed in about, you know, the relationship of this subcommittee and, and his responsibilities. So again, it's like, we're, we're not, we're not consolidating, we're not reducing our options. We're, we're still in the point where they're, we're trying to expand our options for whatever reason on multiple levels. And then uh, there was a fair amount of discussion about how to best use the junior high and the high school and share um, share with uh, Northwest as well. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the reports were done in tandem and, and there's a, there is a lot of intrigue about the benefits of, of what a partnership of, of some sort could be between those two schools. We also um, had an agenda item to um, start looking at the, the questions, if you will, that were in the charge for the subcommittee, but we spent an hour and a half on um, with NESDEC, so we uh, sort of ran out of time and tabled that for our next meeting. Um, I believe that's pretty much the essence of the meeting. Anyone have any questions? Patrick. I just thought I'd sort of quantify a little bit about the statement Kevin made around the, the 900 students. So about 700 of those 900 students are what we've lost in this past 20 years. So when we look back, um, that's how many we have fewer now than we had at one point, which presumably all would fit in the buildings that we currently have because they, they did before. That from a revenue perspective, if, if we had those 700 students, they would probably translate into something around 750 equalized pupils. That would allow us to spend $14.8 million more annually than we can currently spend and stay at the spending threshold. So in terms of sort of that, that overhead that we've been talking about and the underutilization and efficiencies, I think that helps put things in perspective um, from an economic perspective. Good. Oh, Sarah McLean. Um, was there a discussion on uh, what it would cost to upgrade the schools to accommodate its, its consolidation of the two districts? There, there's no, with, within the NASDAQ report, there's, there's no um, cost analysis provi provided. And, um, you know, from my point of view, that's one of the shortcomings of the reports because they were pretty, pretty free to add, uh, well, you can do this, but you might have to add on to the building. <laughs> so they, they weren't tasked and um, with that. So it's not part of the, with, uh, it's not part of the program, but Patrick's, the, team is looking at that and if we and when we get to the point where we're going to narrow down and start looking at um you know architectural options obviously the costing will become much more real at that point as well and one thing i would add to that is while so it, it was a little bit confusing initially why nesdec put in every option that we could add on to a building in that option if that was necessary. Part of that's because, you know, if they if they share an option that says we could close three elementary schools, depending on which three we choose, we might have to put an addition on. So because they didn't say specifically close X, Y, and Z elementary schools, they left it open. Like if we if we chose an option that had us operating three elementary schools and one of them was not Bristol we're putting an addition on somewhere to accommodate the students. If we chose to keep Bristol open, 
and use that building, then we probably wouldn't have to put an addition on. So that's why that language was there for every one of the options. And in terms of the cost for sort of upfits, that is part of it. Part of where I've been going with that is I'm thinking about it from accessibility um, perspective, which I don't know if that was specifically what you're asking about, Sarah, but some of our buildings are far less accessible than others. And so the relative cost in having those buildings that much more full and making them accessible, universally accessible, is very different. So I do think that has to be a factor, but that that in-depth study hasn't happened. <clears throat> and frankly, I don't, it doesn't take an in-depth study to identify which buildings are less accessible than the others. I don't think we need to spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars for architects to tell us that. The, what the precise cost would be to make whatever buildings we continue to operate as universally as accessible as we want them to be, that's gonna require months of work with architects and then probably third party estimators to give us those projections, which is basically the same process we went through with the Mount Abe um, facility redesign, just on a smaller scale for a smaller building. But if we're talking multiple buildings, that would, that would add up in terms of time and money. I think in one day we could tour all of our elementary schools and it would become pretty clear which buildings would cost more to make accessible. I think we could probably do it just thinking of the tours we've already had. Perhaps. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving along. Next is an update on the le legislative update VSBA and Kevin had sent out an email, but I'll let you touch on that, Kevin. Okay, I did send out highlights. I'll just highlight briefly. Um, you know, the, the legis there was a, a, a short discussion about legislative activity given um, the legislature's back this month and then probably into maybe a little bit of September. But um, it was pretty much clear through the Secretary of Ed that nothing's going to happen other than budget things unless there's agreement from everybody. And uh, some of the bigger issues that seem like VSBA was going to seem to work with others to try to get some consensus was the, the calendar, the school day calendar issue. Um, using, not using this year's ADM um, numbers and equalized pupil calcs if they become negative for a school. And then also the, apparently the tech centers are kind of running a little bit behind with COVID activities and that would seem to be a concern. Um, the regional meetings um, were just a reminder, they're going to be starting in September and run through October. Ours was in, last year was in October. They're going to be vir held virtually this year. Um, so there's, there's a, the topic I think they're planning on for regional meetings is more, more of a, um, an informational for different board members and, and administrative people to get together and talk about how they're handling uh, reopening as opposed to having a guest speaker. Um, I won't go over them in detail, but the resolutions committee re reported out on resolutions this year and the board, full board acted on them generally as recommended by the resolution committee. There was a few exceptions that had to do with resolutions that the committee had rejected and then worked with the originators to rework into a more um, uh, uh, into a language that would be more pal uh, um, agreeable, I guess you could say. So some of those revised resolutions were um, rec were changed to recommend to pass <clears throat> by the board. The resolutions will be going before the full membership um, at the annual meeting this fall. I think that's it, unless anybody has any questions. Wait, Krista. Sorry, I just had a question. I, I don't, it wasn't a resolution, but it was a, 
a director's policy, I think, around equity. And I just wondered, like, when the VSBA issues a recommended policy, is that something we, we request to review as a board to see if we want to adopt it? Or how does that work? Because in addition to the resolutions, there was something we got from the VSBA directly that was... Um, Or oh, God. it was in the consent agenda. Yes. Oh. <laughs> so you see so how much I was paying attention at the beginning. Was that so in the board of directors policy? No. It was in our consent agenda. No, yeah. it wasn't. Yeah. yeah, there was some language around conflict of interest. No, no, I'm talking about um, there was a policy that the VSBA came out with that was. Um, the model equity policy. Oh, yeah, Patrick, we talked about that, you and I. Patrick? And so, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, how we can discuss that because I don't think we have a, we have language in our meet, in our ends about this, but I don't think we have a policy quite like that. So I just wondered how we bring that forward to discuss whether we want to adopt some version of that. So I can talk a little bit about the process that we use for adopting policies. And so on the, on the VSBA website, there are required policies. There are, I think, recommended policies and there are optional policies. I may not get the terms right, but they're along those lines. And our practice has been, we have all of the required policies because they're required. And we have very few of the recommended policies. Like we may like, so for example, our auditors, recommended that we have a policy about conflict of interest. So we use the model policy as sort of a guide. And so now we have that. Um, because as a policy governance board, the practice is that your policy governance policies really are what govern the school district. Um, and that we have as few as possible any additional policies that are further restrictions on how the district gets run. So that, that's why the practice is the way it is. Having said that, board gets to set policy. So if there is a, a recommended policy or an optional policy that this board really thinks it needs to have, it can take that action. I'm not inclined to bring forward recommended or optional policies because that goes against the, the sort of principles of policy governance and so I'm, I'm not going to lead the board down that path. But that's sort of procedurally how, how this works. Krista? So if we would like to look at what that policy includes to see how we are ensuring similar philosophies in our district, how do we have that conversation? I think it's an agenda item for the board uh, because it, it would need discussion, right? So mm -hmm. it probably doesn't fit in the consent agenda because typically we're not gonna put items in the consent agenda that we know need discussion. Right. A separate item to discuss the possibility of that policy. If the board says, yes, we wanna move forward with this policy, then it could be in the consent agenda to approve for posting. And then there's, I think it's a, it's maybe a 10 day period that it has to be posted before it can be adopted. For just practically speaking, rather than have a special board meeting 10 days later to actually adopt it, it's usually just on the following month's agenda in the consent agenda to adopt. And you saw some of that today. I think we had policies that were posted and policies that were adopted. So this time we would just add a discussion in one month ahead of the posting, which would be followed up by the adoption. I think it's just a matter of uh, making an agenda request of Dawn. Right. So as, as we've defined it in the policy, so many days before a meeting. And we would then want to make sure that any equity policy doesn't conflict with the ends policy, which also speaks to equity. So we want to make sure that we're, we're cross-referencing policies so we're not being contradictory. 
Right. So you almost have to do an analysis between what the recommended policy coming out of the BSBA looks like as it compares to our policies and see if we're missing something. And it could either be to adopt the recommended policy or it could be a revision to one of our ends policies so that if we are missing something, we get that language in there. And maybe like a year or two years ago, we had that little worksheet, like if you wanted to add an agenda item that asked those questions, is it something already covered in policy? Should it be up, should we amend a policy already in place? And so, but we didn't take any action on using that form. So right now we have to send it to me. And then I typically go through looking like, all right, does this fit anywhere in our policy already? If it does, okay. Is it, as Patrick said, in conflict or, that's what happens right now, but that form would allow the board member to sort of walk through it with it and provide, you know, information, not just because they want it as an agenda item. So if like Krista, if you want to add that as a possible agenda item, then let's look at it together and we could walk through the worksheet together and see, you know how we would fit it in, or if it wouldn't fit in, we could do it that way. Yeah, and I'm wondering if it will relate to our statement conversation and you know what we're trying to achieve as an organization, it might fit into that conversation, but if not, I'd, I'd like to have that walk through with you. Okay. Okay, all right, I'm gonna keep moving, moving on. The next item is a discussion item around um, at the last, not at the retreat, at the meeting before that you, we talked about where did the communication plan fit in our policy and should we have a monitoring report on that? And you sent me back to look and, and come back and let you know what I thought, having looked through our policy, looking at, um, other policy governance policies. Um, nobody else references a specific communication plan, but what they do reference is some key sort of community values that are plugged in that are, and they drill down a little more, which is something we could do to amend the policy, but I didn't want to start down that road if everyone's really thinking, no, no, we really want that as a monitoring report and not added into an exist existing policy. So I didn't want to put a bunch of work in since I was unclear about what path you were all going to go on. You want me to propose some language with a you know a few more specifications in it? I can do that and bring it back to you next time to look at in the policy or you know are you back to thinking that it needs to be very specific to the communication plan? and have a monitoring report and have we'll have to establish an interpretation and and then is that what you're thinking or don is the is the 4.2.1 it's the board's job description and okay. our language sort of it's loosely spelled out but as um susan Mogensen often says you can drill down a little more um, there is like you have to be a little cautious because if you don't want to drill down too much that you only get you know you only see a pinpoint of information so but i in searching around the country and in our in the state of vermont there is a couple of little like sentences that could be added to to and then we'd have to change our interpretation a little bit um talk about do you see the communication plan as part of, of that interpretation or you know could you use that as evidence if you want me to to you know put put some ideas on paper and bring them back and show you I'll do that well I think that might be helpful I'm having a little hard time just sort of following the yeah. process here so. Okay. All right, I'll do that for the next meeting then. Okay. 
And the next item is, um, I don't see any questions. The next item is a discussion slash action item of, uh, around our board statement regarding racial equity. Um, included in the agenda are two options, but having looked through um, things a little more tonight, I think I would ask that you consider a, th a third bit of language, and that was in the document Kevin shared around the resolutions the VSBA put out. There is some language. So I maybe that we look at those three as options. Don, where, where is that? I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I, I missed where that could be. So Kevin sent out an email, let me see. Um, it's called August Highlights, I think he called it. Is it under the resolutions or are you talking about some of yes, the proposed? It is, it is under the resolutions. It's okay. Uh, you sent it on August 20th, if that helps. Yep. And it was the equity and anti-racism resolution. On page seven. I have page. Oh yeah, there is. Resolution number seven. It has some fairly specific uh, references to v action that the VSBA should take. Right. Which obviously we wouldn't adopt. But. Well, Don, have you been working, who, who have you been bouncing this off of? Has it been you and Kristen? So Sarah and Rob created one document. I made changes to the document that created another document and then the resolutions, of course, came from the VSBA. Well, does the ad hoc committee want to continue making another round of uh, revisions and propose something for next meeting? Or Has everyone had an opportunity to read both the original draft and the edited draft? I read the original. Um, I just saw that there was a revised one in the agenda. Can somebody sort of talk through what the differences are? Yeah, I mean, I, from, from my lens, I, I drafted um, the first one um, primarily with, with some input and, uh, from Sarah. And, uh, and then Don, Don, I sent it out to Don and we had a, a short back and forth regarding you know, some changes and that that were made. Um, you know, I think a couple key things that to me, um, in, in all honesty, I, I feel like the, the, the revised draft is is whitewashed, um, slightly whitewashed. Um, I don't use that term lightly. And, uh, it, you know, we, we take out um, including black indigenous and people of color. Um, I mean, the fact that we, we won't even just publicly state that Black Lives Matter, um, I find that sort of frustrating um, if, if we were to adopt that, that the revised draft. Uh, you know, there were some, some more uh, maybe logistical pieces like we, as a board, we hadn't formally, um, you know, heard from members of our community uh, in, 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 I guess in the setting of maybe a board meeting during public comment. 
um, outside of maybe just personally driving around and seeing all the signs and or engaging with their constituents. And, uh, and then there was a, in, in the first draft uh, recommendation regarding um, some curriculum. And uh, I, I don't know if that was excluded or is excluded because maybe that, that's us dabbling more in means um, than ends. But um, so that, that was, I mean, that, that's how I saw the first version, the um, re-edited version. I still haven't had a chance to read the VSBA's language yet. And uh, so that's what I have, Steve. Thank you. I'm curious um, if if we can open it up, if, if people want to have this discussion now in the agenda of why uh, the, the sentence in humble terms, Black Lives Matter was omitted from the original draft. From the revised draft, you mean? No, in the original draft, um, it, it, the, the letter ends um, with, to begin in humble terms, Black Lives Matter, which was omitted in the revised draft. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. It sounded like you said it was omitted in the original version. Okay, sorry, I don't. I was wondering that same thing. I, I didn't put it in the second one because the board had not made any statement regarding Black Lives Matter. And just as the board had not received any comment in public session, which is the only time when we can, can we act as a board is in public session. So if I, the board did not, I went back and listened to the tape that we talked about systematic um, ra racism and injustice, but the board did not give any, they said write it, but they didn't give any, they didn't say anything about those specific things. Any. Um, but the other thing that I noticed um, was just comparing the two side by side and the very first paragraph of the original document, we say that um, the, you know, global pain and grief and unrest, catalyzed from the tragic and unjust death of George Floyd and countless other black Americans has made the MAUSD school board reflect on how we are complicit in the continuation of systemic racism that is found within our educational system. And that was changed in the revision. And it simply says that it's made the MAUSD school board reflect on the current shortcomings toward equity in our school system. And I wondered if there was a specific reason that we took out the systemic racism piece and, and maybe that's what Rob meant by the fact that it's whitewashed. I don't know. I, I'm just wondering. Patrick? I'm trying to think about how to help, help foster a more productive conversation. I think it's less about what's in which one and what isn't in the other and who took what out. To me, it's a matter of the question is, what's the statement this board wants to make? One is a much more, a much stronger, uh, I don't know how else to, to describe it, but, but they, they make similar and yet different statements. And, and the question is, what's, what's the statement this board wants to sit on? The more aggressive stance or the softer tone. And then working out the details from there could happen. But I think to know which direction the board wants to go might be helpful. Kevin? I've been thinking about this since we um, last discussed moving forward or something and um, not having read anything until just recently in preparation for tonight's meeting, but I, I think that we should, as a board, look at policy in a sense of what is right and what is just and not necessarily go down a bunch of rabbit holes about us and them and that sort of thing. And then furthermore, I'm concerned a little bit that we um, 
end up um, supporting or, in, or infer support of an organization that we don't have any control over and over the period of time they could change their philosophies radically and we've got it pigeonholed in a policy or a statement somewhere so my my recommendation would be to stay at a policy level if you will and not get into um a lot of the details of supporting or showing support for specific stances Dave. So um, I think we, uh, I would support the using, uh, uh, making a statement in the strongest possible terms. I think that uh, I, I, I am a little sensitive to what Kevin is saying in the sense that I think we should stay away from trigger words. There's a brouhaha going on in Bristol on Front Porch Forum on whether the leaders of, front of the Black Lives Matter movement are Marxist or not. And uh, it reminds me a little of Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X when I was a young person, you know, of trying to blame the Black people for their own demise. Um, you know, so I think we should stay away from trigger words that are going to incite controversy, but I don't want to whitewash it. I do want to make the statement in the strongest possible terms. Krista? I agree with Dave. I think that um, it's less about the organization. It's more about us specifically saying that, that this relates to people of color. And um, my daughter Isabel's here listening in because she's been part of a group of students that have been having a vigil on the green in Bristol. And, um, you know, I think they're really interested in hearing what's going to happen in our schools, and it makes me wonder what would happen if school, uh, if students were interested in raising a flag for Black Lives Matter and this same conversation and what support we would throw behind that. Um, so I'm really glad we're having the conversation here. I think it's really important for us to figure out how to move it forward um, without diluting our message. Um, equity for all students is, is of utmost important in our district, but we're specifically in this moment de deciding whether we wanna make a statement about racism against people who are black and brown and indigenous. Caleb? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I like the original statement. Uh, I, don't, I don't really like the revised statement. Um, and I just want to be careful to not, you know, Black Lives Matter may be an organization, but I think much more fundamentally, it's an affirmation and one that we, that we need to make. That's not about, um, I don't think it, it, it's really about what, what, you know, a, a specific organization might be doing or not doing. It's a really just core recognition of, of, uh, the humanity of a, of a, of a group that we know if, if we look um, has, has been on the receiving end of, of just um, centuries of injustice. So I think that to say black lives matter um, is, is important. Um, I support the statement that includes those words and I don't have any misgivings about doing so. Could we do it in lowercase letters, not capital letters? Would that make a difference? I don't have an opinion on that. That seems less important to me, but I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I, 
I think we either say Black Lives Matter or we don't, and the you know various punctuation or capitalization isn't important. But I don't think we need to shy away from that in the sense that well, there's a Black Lives Matter organization and they may take a political position that we find untenable. For me, should that happen? I think it's such a multifaceted organization. I don't know that that's likely, but even if it was, I, I don't think that the statement is the statement, you know, um, those words just have basic English language meaning. The, the sentence at the end, I don't, I don't disagree with keeping a reference to Black Lives Matter. I think, frankly, the whole point of having this statement, if it was for Black Lives Matter, we wouldn't be making this statement anyway. So I think they deserve all the recognition here. Um, the statement is a little odd just in English terms. It kind of, it, it sounds like there's a beginning of a discussion, but it's the end of the statement. If it was to say something like, uh, as a board, we hear you, we vow to help lead the MAUSD community onto the pathway of the right side of history. And and in, and so fully support the, um, you know, the, the, um, I'm, I'm fighting for the word, you know, the, um, the intent behind the Black Lives Matter movement or something of you know, the, you know, just sort of finish it in a more um, sort of a wrap it up kind of English fashion rather than the, the statement just is a little odd at the end, but I have no issue with a full recognition of the movement that really basically brought this to our, you know, to the forefront. And, and Kevin, just to, and Dave, just to, I, I wasn't referencing the political action of the actual organization also in, in writing that. It was it's more of the sentiment as Caleb spoke, spoke to and others have spoke to, just, just, to, just so you understand that. Too. Yeah, and I'm just saying it, that's the only thing about it that I have a hard time with is just, it's, it's just the way that it ends. That's all. So, and that's just a grammatical thing more than anything. Well, I'm okay with having Black Lives Matter in there. I don't, I don't mean to uh, suggest I don't. Um, I just I just want to make sure that we make the statement in the strongest possible means. Rob, I might throw out a, I have to think about this a little bit more, but I might throw out an ending just for you to think about. You can toss it in the circular file if you'd like. <clears throat> but I have to think about it a little bit more. So how do we move forward with this? Um, what would be helpful from your perspective, Don, to get a read on, on who's comfortable with certain language or um, is this a, is this going to need to be a vote of some kind? Well, there, there has to be, well, we have it as a discussion slash action item. So always when we have it as an action item that action can be to not take any action or take a action it seems like well steve needs time to think through i don't know if anybody else is feeling they need time to think through andrew we didn't really hear from you I, or, or um liz and i don't know if you want to add anything or if you need time to think through
so what we could do is allow time for people to send comments and sort of go back and re you know see what the comments are and make adjustments bring it back next time or Steve? yeah i don't think one more round of reflection is going to hurt anything here so you you'll have to tell me what you want to do do you want to do you want to have it go another round at it and bring it back next time we can just table it for the next meeting can't we yep you can you can just make a motion to table it till the next meeting that's my motion okay is there a second Dave, I think you're muted. I can't tell. I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Sarah. I just uh, want to say that, you know, it, it is, it's, I see it's coming together and it's good to have this discussion. It, it is a little disheartening that, you know, that this conversation has been ever present in our country um, for months now and we, 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 you know, just, we still need to toss it around. I mean, I, I understand we want to get the wording right and I respect the process, but it's a little disheartening that, um, that we're going to just, you know, sit on it again for another month as if it weren't, you know, I, I, I think it's of utmost importance to send the message to our community of where this board is, especially in this time, especially given our conversations that we've been having tonight about the importance of this body as the informed body that was representing our owners. Um, so I just need to say that. Annie? Yep, you're muted. I just wanna say that um, I agree with Sarah 100% and it's exactly what I was thinking. I just didn't know how to say it, but I am 100% on the same page. I really hate the idea of tabling it for another month because I feel like it's just too important that that we need to get it out there. Anna, do you have your hand up? Oh yeah. So um this is like from a student perspective, but um can you guys hear me? Okay. Can now okay, yeah. cool. Um this is from like a student perspective um, but I'm part of a group of students that have been for the past like couple months, I think, um, organizing vigils on the town green um, every couple weeks. And um, we, one of the things we talked about while planning this was like uh, stuff that we wanted to see in uh, Mount Names curriculum. Um, like in regards to like racial stuff. And I think it's really important that like in the future, if we can like to have a class that like really, or like elective and then required class that really like uh, dives into like, cause there's an American studies class already. Um, but I think that like scratches the surface of uh, stuff that's happened in the past. And like this will be the past one day for kids. And I think it's really important uh, to have like an opportunity for kids to like really learn about uh, the like racial inequality that has happened in our country for a while um i also think like that it would be nice to like integrate more um like learning about black authors and stuff and like etc because we do that during like black history month but we should do that like all the time because like it's really important and I think um, like especially when we go back to school like it's not 
and I've been telling this to like my peers and friends like it's not gonna go away so I think when we go back to school like it's really important that we like talk about it um and like the teachers talk about it with their classes um because it's a really important thing that uh happened and is happening um and I think it's really important that we talk about it and yeah Thank you, Hannah. Okay, so the, mo the motion right now is to table the discussion, come back with another draft. So if there aren't any more comments on this, that's the question I'm gonna ask you. All those in favor of tabling the action discussion topic regarding racial or the statement regarding racial equity please say aye 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 all those opposed nay no nay nay okay so it's not tabled so we're still discussing I move we go with the uh, first draft of the letter. I second that. And I'd like to just, if I may, open up the discussion saying maybe we could authorize some additional word smithing, but with some core principles of the message. I don't want to overthink this, but if there's a, I also don't want to force a level of specificity that, you know, if, the, I, I don't know, to me, uh, Anyway, that, that's just it. But I still second it. <laughs> that's my question. Any other comments? Annie? I, I would agree with that. I feel like we should go with the first one, but can we make a few changes to it, keeping keeping the basis of the first one, the majority of the first one, but can we make a few changes? Okay, Rob? Yeah, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll gladly take anyone's feedback and, and add it in and compile it. Um, and yeah, and I also agree, I don't, we shouldn't wait an another month. I mean, this has been two months now and uh, like feeling like we're getting feedback uh, when, when we're writing, I don't know, so. Steve? Yeah, so I mean, the only reason I was talking about changing, tabling, it was simply to give people time to give somebody feedback and then we can't really do anything with it until we meet again, right? It's just a procedural thing. It's not really putting it off for any emotional reason. It's just how do we execute changes to the document? Do we just send them to Rob and he issues it as a public statement without the board acting on it? The second time, I mean, that's really just all it's about. Dave? What about having a special meeting one week from tonight for the sole purpose? The only piece on the agenda will be to discuss this letter. We should be able to dispose of it in a half an hour. Um, you know, this is important stuff. And um, I think we have a responsibility to get it right. Um, so, Rob and Sarah and Steve and whoever else wants to have input, um, get a draft done and we'll consider it a week from tonight at six o'clock. I think a week from tonight is a community engagement meeting as well. Yeah. Well, that might be a good excuse for everybody to show up at that meeting. And that meeting is scheduled for seven o'clock. Good. It gives us an hour to work on it.
Gen Sarah Lapero? Is it mostly just the last line? That like really what I'm just from what I've been listening to, it seems like a lot of it comes down to the last line. Well, and there is that sentence about we've heard from community members that really we haven't heard from community members the only time we act as a board. So that could raise some concern if people go back and look and say they never, nobody ever said anything at a meeting. What are they talking about? As far as the timeline, I can, you know, if people get stuff to me sooner than later, um, I can, I have plenty of time between now and next Tuesday during my daughter's naps to fill in, fill in the edits or the omissions or whatever, whatever needs to happen. So according to our process, though, we got to run it through me so that there isn't some sort of action on the backside happening where things are happening around. So if people send me the feedback, I will send it directly to Rob. Krista? Just a logistical question. So are we saying, and I might prefer actually, like that we would meet maybe at 6.30 and the community engagement committee would meet at seven or something like that. Um, this is a super important conversation and I know the community engagement conversation will take some time. So I want to make sure that we don't get squeezed on both ends. Will that work for people or do you think you need longer? Do you think we could do it in a half hour or do you think we will need longer? I'm fine with a half an hour. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Okay. Yeah, I think we're close to there. And as a point of order, we've got a motion on the table right now to approve the original version, correct? Correct. You want to vote on that now? If the maker of that motion wants to withdraw their motion, I'll withdraw my second. Dave, I think you made the motion and you I said make, so that, that would be good. You make the motion, Dave. All right, I'll withdraw my motion. So I think where we landed is if board members have feedback, they're going to send it to me and I'm going to send it to Rob. We will meet one week from tonight before the community engagement meeting at 630 with a final draft to approve. That will be the one item on our agenda. So moved. So that was Steve. Is there a second so we're clear? Yeah, I second Caleb. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? All those in favor of giving it one more round and um, sending feedback to, to me that I will forward on to Rob and meeting again in one week at 6.30 to go over the final draft. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. Okay. We don't need an executive session, correct, Patrick? Correct. Okay. Is there any, I don't, oh, Isabel is an attendee. I don't know. Is there any public comment? I see Isabel's there. Hang on one second. She's standing right next to me. Oh. <laughs> Are you muted? Here. No. I think she's good. Okay. Okay. I do have one. I don't think it fits public comment, Don, but Jennifer sent an email on uh, August 12th. Pay orders. 
We're missing one signature from that pay order group. We can't quite make out all the signatures, but we think we've narrowed it down to the missing signature is either one of the Sarah's, Kristen, or Steve. So if, if those four folks could go back to that August 12th email and just check to see if your signature is on that page. And if it is or isn't, just let Jennifer know either way so we can try to narrow down who's the missing signature so we can make sure that we complete that, um, that pay order. When she sent out the missing signature email, when I looked at the document she sent, my signature was on it. Yeah. It was, okay. Yes. Good. And the other pieces, the pay orders went out this morning. So did everybody, has anybody seen them? I signed them first thing this morning. So Kevin, did you sign them? You were next. I have, I have signed them. So they're on to whoever's next. Okay. So. Do you have a, do you know? The they made it to me and I sent them along to you today. Okay. I, I may have a doc. Oh, I don't have, I don't know if she's updated that one. Um, let me see if I can see where they are. You know, uh, is, it, is it the fact that there's not a printed name under the signature line that makes it difficult to know who the signature is? Yeah, it just says board member one, board member two, board member three. Oh, that's because we, some of us hand signed it. Correct. It's the hand signatures that, that we can't make out. The other ones show up as typed names. We're yeah, good yeah. with those. Am I not on there? I'm number 10. Yeah, I think it's me, people. Sorry. And, and my intent was not to call anybody out tonight. I just wanted it's to me. put it down. So. <laughs> I so. just got it in my email. I'll take care of it. Okay. So Sarah, you're thinking you were the the prior signature that was missing, which is great. I, we can... Yeah, I think I don't. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I'm pretty illegible, but I, I don't see that. I don't see my signature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and just work with Jennifer with any support you need to get that done and get it to her. Thank you. Okay. So the next round, it, I can't tell. Liz said you signed them today and she doesn't have it marked off yet. So it's it's going so just keep checking your inbox and your junk mail or spam i don't know where it ends up okay like i said it just arrived in my email box at 5 30. okay all right so as soon as you sign it'll go on to the next one does anybody have the meeting evaluation up Yes. I'm sorry. Can can I just hand this to Isabel for a minute? She did oh. feel like she wanted to say one thing. Sorry, yeah. I'm going to hand the whole thing over. Hang on. Thank you. Um, Hi. Back to talking about the statement. Um, and I know it's going to be discussed. Sure they can, hear you. Uh, can you guys hear me? You're a little um, quiet. It's going to be discussed at a later meeting, but I just wanted to... Um, feedback on what I thought when I read it and that was about like the revised version not specifically like really including or specifically talking about students of color or saying that like outright I can't hear, can't um, hear. I think that the first or the revised draft um, kind of like skirted around saying out students of color or black students um, and it instead just said um, we want equity for all, all students so I think but I think it's important that we specifically address that like these issues are affecting specifically uh, students of color um, and I think it's important to say that um, and not like just kind of I guess whitewash it Okay. 
Thank you. Did somebody have up the meeting evaluation? I have it open. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so today's meeting is the 25th. Uh, Andrew, level of engagement of all board members, high or low? Hi. So far, thanks, well. Hi. One person says hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. Two people say hi. I talk, Hello. Uh, hi. I talk too much, so I can't really vote. Okay. You know. <laughs> you can't see well, us. Was, uh, was the agenda followed? Yes. yes or no? Any comments about that? Okay, no comments. Uh, does the chair effectively establish the agenda and materials for yes. distribution to the board? Yes. Comments? Absolutely. Yes. Would you say, Steve? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, says Steve. Is the chair effective in fostering a professional culture regarding fair and open deliberation, full participation of all members, and ensuring the integrity of the board process? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Comments, any? No comments. Uh, other feedback for the chair? No feedback. What went well with the meeting? No comments. What suggestions do you have for ways to improve future meetings? Okay, no comments. All right, I'll click done. All right, there we go. Thank you. All right, I just need a motion to adjourn at 841. So, so move Sarah McLean. I'll second Andrew. All those in favor of adjourning at 841, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone.